And all God's children said amen for Keith and Angela's prelude. So beautiful this morning. Welcome to those who are both worshiping in person today and those who are worshiping with us online. We are glad that you are here. And let us be reminded that we are a church and thus we are disciples of Christ. A movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. As part of the one body of Christ, we welcome all to the Lord's table as God has welcomed us. Next Sunday, we will be going to two in-person worship services at 8.30 and 10.45 a.m. So those of you who said, oh, it's just too early for me to be in worship, 10.45, we'll see you next Sunday. And for those of you who said, oh, it's too late for us to be in worship, we'll see you at 8.30 next Sunday. Also, our online service will move to the 1045 service, and we will be broadcasting both on Facebook Live and YouTube Live. Mm -hmm. We will also have Children's Church for those ages 4 through 4th grade, and social distancing will take place in the Fellowship Hall. Next Sunday, we will have a drive-by celebration from 2 to 3.30 in honor of the ministry of Mickey McHugh at First Christian Church. Next Sunday is Mickey's last Sunday with us, and we give God thanks for her ministry. Amen. So as we gather for worship, hear now this call to worship. Here in this place and many other places, we come to worship the living God. In God we hope. In the creator of love we live. Here in this sacred place and all the sacred places where we worship this day. In these very moments, we are invited to a banquet table by the shepherd of all. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us. For our use thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine we are. Early let us seek thy favor, be the guardian of our way. Keep thy flock from sin, defend us, seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear thy children when we pray. loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, love us still. Let us pray. 
Holy God, we come to gather and worship this morning to feel your presence and your grace, your love and your hope. We come this morning to truly let ourselves be here in this presence, to fully be in this moment so that we can hear and see you through praise and song, prayers and words. This morning, God, allow us to fully feel you in your holy name. Amen. This morning, as we went and did, uh, was looking at some scripture, I was looking at Leviticus 23, 22. It says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field. When you reap, nor shall you gather any gleaning from your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. So why did God tell the Israeli farmers they couldn't harvest the whole field? It didn't make much business sense. It was like leaving money on the ground. I believe God was trying to teach them something. Always leave space for God. Our tithing is like that. We don't need to hold tightly on to every single dollar we make. Instead, like the Israeli farmers, we need to give the corners to God. This is where the real blessing is. Our tithe is giving room for God to move. It opens up possibilities for God to continue to use us in this world to share God's love and peace. So this morning, give from the corners of your lives via push pay or dropping off or mailing your check to the church office. Let us pray. Holy God, we come this morning to give back to you from our abundance, to share your love with us, with those in our communities and in our worlds, to give from the corners of our lives. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm so glad that Jim's preaching on Psalm 23 this morning. I'm glad he's preaching on a psalm. I love the psalms, although I'm a little disturbed. His sermon title apparently is Ain't No Mountain High Enough, and I don't know if he's going to go all Diana Ross on us or not. But we're going to sing, uh, well, I'm going to sing it, and you're going to sing it in, in your heart, of this paraphrase written by Isaac Watts Now, uh, back in the 18th century. Now, back in the day, you know, the, the reformers, uh, they thought that, a lot of them thought that psalms were really the only thing you could sing in church, and so you had folks coming out with all kinds of paraphrases of psalms, uh, that, trying to make them rhyme and trying to make them, you know, scan in the hymn tunes, and a lot, you know, that you get some really awkward uh, lines when you have to do that, and you can look these up on the internet, and some of, like the Bay Psalm book that the uh, pilgrims, you know, came over on the Mayflower, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, too. They, they use this stuff. Um, Isaac Watts apparently went to church one Sunday when he was a teenager and uh, just got really irritated at how badly these psalms were paraphrased into English, and he told his, he complained about it to his dad, and his dad said, well, if you're so smart, why don't you go and do it? And so he did it. And um, I, I really like, I carry that story around in me. That's kind of the model for ministry that I do when other people would, would complain to me at Bridgeport. I'd say, well, you go do it. Um, which I just, I really think that uh, God did a great work through Isaac Watts. And I pray that uh, if you hear this and think, well, I could do better, please, by all means, put your hand to the plow. And, and we all need to be there for building God's kingdom together. shepherd you supply my need most holy is your name in pastures fresh you make me feed beside the living stream you bring my water My cup 
ring in the background here at church we come to our time of prayer we lift up both joys and concerns this morning we give congratulations to Bill and Crystal Patrick who were united in marriage last evening here in our sanctuary Don Montgomery we remember as she continues therapy and rehab at home and she is getting stronger each week. We continue to remember Jean Sutherland, the sister-in-law of Diane and Mike Sparrow. She had further surgery a couple of weeks ago and she is home but is having a difficult time. We also lift up Frida Prater, mother of Lana Peach, who is in the hospital in Lexington following surgery this week. We also lift up Ruth Sally, mother of Doug, who has been diagnosed with cancer concerns, and the family covets our prayers. We also lift up the family of Tom Lawrence. His mother passed from this life to eternal life over the weekend. Tom and his mother have been on our prayer list, and Tom lives in Florida. Certainly there are many others on our hearts and in our minds as we go to God in prayer. God certainly knows them all. Let us pray together. O oh God, shepherd of all your people, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. You have been there before the mountains were brought forth you have held the life of this world as a parent holds a fragile infant. You have formed the very earth that sustains us and nourishes us. Indeed, you are the everlasting God, our good shepherd, our gracious host. For this we give our deepest thanks. And we all, like sheep, have gone astray led away from the right path that Jesus our Christ paved for us. Like a shepherd, lead us into those places where Jesus would have us go and help us to be more Christ-like in all we do and say. And this morning we pray for our country, fighting virus, bracing for elections, trying to work and educate our kids and love our neighbors and family in this unnerving time. Through it all, O oh God, enrich our common life. Strengthen the forces of truth and goodness among us. Move us to give where we are prosperous, that the impoverished may pass from need and despair to dignity and joy. Move us to speak where we have voice, that the silence and the ignored may come to flourish. Move us to seek the benefit of our neighbors near and far, that a spirit of mutual concern and care might come to characterize our 
character. And we pray for all who suffer, the sick, the lonely, the grieving, the overworked, and the out of work. Surround us all with your love. Support us with your strength. Console us with your comfort. And give us hope and courage beyond ourselves. In those times when we might be feeling empty, may your spirit fill us so that we may keep going. May that sense of your love remind us that we are all part of a shared family and that whatever affects one of us affects us all. May your spirit guide us to do what is right by our neighbors just as we ever aspire to hold you tight and your ways. Indeed, we ask that you hold all of us close this day and every day as we lift our prayers in the name of the great shepherd, Jesus our Christ. Amen. This morning, Jane Bennett will share a harp solo. The Gift of Love Thank you, Jane, and what a beautiful way to lead us in to the 23rd Psalm. If you ask someone who, what is their favorite verse or verses in the Bible, more than likely, Psalm 23 will be at the top of the list. I suspect I've used the 23rd Psalm as much, if not more, than any scripture at funerals. Raise your hand if somewhere along the way you memorized Psalm 23. 
Maybe it was as a youth, maybe as an adult. But Psalm 23 is the most memorized text of the Bible after the Lord's Prayer. And it's right, Keith, the title of my sermon is Ain't No Mountain High Enough. Ain't No Valley Low Enough. Come on, sing it with me. No, I'm kidding. Don't, don't sing it with me. I was going to have you play it, but you left the piano, so probably for the best. Yes, yes. But it does remind us that nothing separates us from God. That God is always with us. And today I want to share a traditional version of this text and a more contemporary one. One will be from the King James Version, which I don't often use in worship because there are most more recent translations with far more sources than what the King James Version used. And the second is from a fairly new translation, the Common English Bible, read by one of our elementary age children. As we prepare to hear this beloved scripture, let us join together in singing, Be Still and Know. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I Psalm 23, the King James Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He lets me rest in grassy meadows. He leads me to restful waters. He guides me in proper paths for the sake of his good name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no danger because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they protect me. You set a table right for me, right in front of my enemies. You bathe my head in oil. My cup is so full, it spills over. Yes, goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the Lord's house as long as I live. Is it that the sweetest thing you've heard in a while? Thanks, Emmy. It was so comforting, just as the psalm has brought comfort to so many with its images of green pastures and still waters and shepherds leading their sheep. Well, what do you think of when you think of a shepherd? For me, it's a shepherd that Rhonda and I met on our trip to Ireland two years ago this month. The contemporary shepherd also uses highly trained and highly skilled dogs. Here is a picture of a dog gathering a sheep among the hills and rocks and green grass of Ireland. 
The shepherd simply blows a whistle and the, the dog goes and gathers all the sheep together and brings them back. And oftentimes we think of a shepherd as male, but this picture shows that there are also female shepherds in our world today. The image of God as a shepherd runs throughout scripture. It's a job description that the ancient Israelites would have been familiar with and with much of the world throughout history. When society was more agricultural, but in today's world of agribusiness, when only a few farmers spend time on the land with their animals, we have become increasingly distant from this image. Very few animals anymore get to wander in green pastures. Instead, they lead miserable short lives in factory farms. And the image of the shepherd calls us back to a better way a more beautiful life for the sheep and the shepherd. The picture of the shepherd we may have is that Irish man with gray flecked hair, Wellington boots, a worn tweed jacket, and a wool cap. He has a few sheep dogs running around his heels until some subtle signal for the dog to run ahead and bring the sheep together. The sheep from a distance are white fluffy dots in a country landscapes, little clouds in a sea of verdant green grass. At least that's our fantasy, isn't it? But get up close and sheep are a different matter. They are not white, but usually dirty and soiled. Their coats are not soft and fluffy so much as tangled and matted. You wouldn't want to snuggle with them necessarily. They smell. They make weird noises. Oh yes, the lambs are cute, but the sheep, not so much. But if the shepherd is God, then you know who we are. The sheep. <laughs> Lovely from a distance, but messy, smelly. And let's admit it, at times, a bit dim-witted when you get up close. And yet, God indeed gets up close. God came to earth in human form to once again be a shepherd. And as the CEB version we heard says, will pursue us all the days of our lives. Psalm 23 is certainly a comforting psalm. It's a psalm of trust. But as Reverend Shannon Kirshner suggests, Psalm 23 is also a subversive psalm. Now, I can hear some of you saying, how on earth is claiming that the Lord is my shepherd subversive in any way whatsoever? I understand. When many of us think about shepherd, we think about idyllic pastoral scenes or we think about the fact that being a shepherd has been a very glamorous job. But more than likely, however, we do not say shepherd and think rebellious. What makes this psalm subversive right off the bat is when the psalmist states explicitly, the Lord is my shepherd. She is stating just as strongly, and the rest of you are not. Walter Brugman, in his book, The Treat of Life, Sermons on Pain, Power, and Weakness, says in this simple opening line, the psalmist is figuratively drawing the line in the sand. By claiming the Holy One as shepherd, the psalmist is claiming that the Lord is king, 
sovereign, the one who directs, to whom he is answerable, whom alone he trusts and serves. Are you getting a taste of the rebellion yet? When we pray the Lord is my shepherd, we are saying there is no rival loyalty, no competing claim on our allegiance. When we pray the Lord is my shepherd, we are saying our ultimate allegiance is to our creator, not to country or to faith tradition or to the military or to capitalism or to fear or even to our family. When we claim the Lord is my shepherd, we are claiming our ultimate allegiance belongs first and foremost to the Holy One, to our God. The Lord is my shepherd is a subversive claim. And frankly, that claim feels even more charged today. Yet that claim is subversive on all of our days, not just in times of upheaval, but in all our days. Even when social distancing will be no longer and life will get back to a new normal, there will continue to be many, many voices out in the marketplace, out in the land of social media, out in the world of celebrity worship who clamor for our ultimate allegiance. Yet in all those moments, including the one in which we currently live, we can breathe in the voice of Psalm 23. And let us fill us with courage and strength and comfort. The Lord is my shepherd. No one and nothing else. The story is told of an actor who was known for his readings and recitations from the classics. He always ended his performance with the dramatic recital of Psalm 23. Each night, without exception, as the actor began his recitation, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The crowd would listen attentively and then rise with thunderous applaud in appreciation of the actor's ability to bring the psalm to life. <clears throat> One night, just before the actor was to offer his customary recital of Psalm 23, a young woman from the audience spoke up. Sir, if you don't mind, could I recite the Psalm 23 tonight. The actor was surprised by this unusual request. However, he invited the young woman to come into the stage to recite the psalm. Curious to see the ability of this young person weighed against his own immense talent. And softly, the young woman began to recite the words of the psalm. And when she was finished, there was no applause. There was no standing ovation as on other nights. All that could be heard was the sound of weeping. The audience had been so moved by the young woman's presentation that every eye was tearful. Amazed by what he had experienced, the actor asked, I don't understand. I have been performing Psalm 23 for years. I have a lifetime of experience and training, but I have never been able to move an audience 
as you have tonight. Tell me, what is your secret? To which the young woman humbly replied, Well, sir, you know the psalm, but I know the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. There's a story of a young boy who lost his parents at a young age. He went to live with his elderly grandfather who was a shepherd of many sheep on his farm. The grandfather was a devo very devoted man. He read the boy's scripture every single night. And even the though the boy could not read, he memorized the first line of Psalm 23. And the grandfather said, this is how you can remember. Take your hand and recite five words. The Lord is my shepherd. And each night, the young boy before bed would hold up his hand and he would recite the psalm, The Lord is, and he would always stop on my, the fourth finger, and hold it tightly. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, the grandfather taught the young boy many things. And he taught him how to be a shepherd. But he would never let him go into the hills by himself. It was, it was just too treacherous. Until the old grandfather was just not able to do it anymore. And he had trained and trained and finally trusted at this point the young man to go into the hills and to look for the sheep. Well, one very cold, snowy day, the young man went out to gather the sheep together. And as the day went on, he did not return. And it was becoming near night. And the grandfather said, I've got to search for him. I've got to go look. Oh, God, help me to look for him. And he went out, and by that time it was a blizzard condition. And he went as far as he could on the path that he thought his grandson might be, but he could not see him every, anywhere. And the darkness descended, and he could not go any farther. So he returned home and he prayed for God to surround his grandson to protect him in the blizzard. It was a very restless night for the grandfather. And the next day at dawn, the snow had stopped, and the grandfather went out looking for the grandson to where he thought he might have been. And sure enough, there was a pile of snow, bigger than all the rest. And he began to dig. And sure enough, the grandson was there. He had died in the night. But the grandfather noticed that the grandson was clutching to his fourth finger. The Lord is my shepherd. So how does something that is mine become ours when one loaf is broken into many pieces and shared with every one of us? When one cup 
is poured. And all of us are able to drink from it. This is the table of our shepherd, set here and set in all of your homes, and we are all invited to share in this feast so that our cups can overflow, so that we can be fed, so that we can be nourished to go and do the ministry that our shepherd sends us out to do. So let us prepare our hearts for these gifts this morning as we share together in the prayer that our shepherd taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took a simple loaf of bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body broken for you. For as often as you take of it, do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Ever-present God, if faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, then this table is our weekly exercise in faith. Throughout the past few months, we have come together around this table as a community of believers, but perhaps not in our usual manner. Perhaps we aren't in the same space or breathing the same air. But just as the Bible tells us that you are not confined to any certain mountain or temple, we know that you serve as host for this feast wherever we may be, and we hear your invitation. As we partake of this bread that signifies the strength and depth of your love for us through the sacrifice of your son, Remind us that we are made one by your love and that the world is looking at our unity and making decisions about the truth of the gospel by what is seen. May they see Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus had dinner with his, those closest to him. And after dinner, he took the cup. He blessed it. And he said, do this. In remembrance of me. It's been called many things. A cup of salvation. A cup of redemption. But first, it was a cup of remembrance. So let us lift the cup, drink, and remember Jesus. Let us pray. Most Holy Creator, we come to you at this time of communion to give thanks and honor to you and to remember you. And may we always take the time to remember you and your sacrifice for us. We pray all this in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Sometimes my life just don't make sense at all When the mountains look so big And my faith just seems so small So hold me, Jesus Cause I'm shaking like a leaf You've been my king of glory won't you be my Prince of Peace? And I wake up in the night and feel the 
dark And it's so hot inside my soul I swear there must be blisters on my heart So hold me, Jesus Cause I'm shaking like a leaf You've been my king of glory Won't you be my prince of peace? Surrender don't come natural to me I'd rather fight you for something I don't really want Than to take what you give that I need And I beat my head against so many walls I'm falling down, I'm falling on my knees and the Salvation Army Band is playing this hymn. And your grace rings out so deep, it makes my resistance seem so thin. So hold me, Jesus, cause I'm shaking like a leaf. You have been my King of glory. Won't you be my Prince of Peace? So hold me, Jesus, cause I'm shaking like a leaf. You have been my King of Glory. Won't you be my Prince of Peace? Though I change the light, the light that is in one place at one time can now be in many places all at once, this room and so many others. Let us pray. <clears throat> God, this week may we feel your presence, may we feel that place to step out and share who we are in your name, may we see those in the street and at school, and at work, and all those places around, and you remind it that they are your children today and every day. May we go forth knowing the blessings that fill our lives that we get to share. In your holy name, amen. amen. 